Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Morris Duffy and I'm absolutely thrilled, delighted, uh, enthusiastic about the opportunity to talk to the wonderful Ebony Jewel Ray Rainford. So, Ebony, hello. Hello, thanks for having me, first of all, and I'm delighted to talk to you too. Oh, man, when I saw you on, um, what's it, Test Mask Special, Brad, I, uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the exchange because you seem to have uh, an interest in those things that kind of fascinate me, which is uh, around mindset and uh, skill and capability. So where are you today, everybody? Me? I'm in London. Well, first of all, I have to say, when we were on uh, BBC Test Match Special, I am such a geek around mindset. And um, I think I annoyed other people because I kept sort of parking them so I could ask you more questions. It was honestly amazing to meet you. Um, so, yeah, I'm at home, as a lot of people are. I'm in sort of central London. Um, and luckily, I mean, the weather's been good, which is keeping spirits high. Uh, but we're all in lockdown. Um, work yeah. is shut down. And so it's a new way of the world. Yeah, but you don't have a library behind you because everybody I noticed on the BBC right now has a has a has a library behind them because obviously we want to show ourselves as being intelligent and clever and intellectual. But I know that you're a fascinating reader of books. So what kind of books are you occupying yourself with right now? Yeah, I've been reading loads actually. Um, I read. I was sort of just going through with you a moment ago. I read loads of books around mindset. So some of my favourites, Stephen Covey, which I often dip his books, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, especially now when like, I don't know, you get a bit tetchy and you need to work through things. His bit about responsibility or response, you know, space ability always kind of sits with me. So I re read his books a lot. Uh, Carol Dweck is one um, her book around growth mindset. So at this time where we're being challenged, I know it's a time to kind of reflect on how we can grow and use this opportunity. So I'm always reading books. Um, having a look on your shelf as well behind you. I, there's a few I'm going to be tucking into. So yeah, keeping myself Steve busy. Covey That's Steve Smith there. one as well. Uh, Stephen Covey is just there. Look, it's... Uh, oh yeah. First things, first, uh, first things, first every day. Yeah, oh, I haven't read that one actually. Uh, it's all his thoughts. So he goes through 365, 365 mornings. So it's, it's called First Things, First Every Day. And it's just a, a daily reminder. You can pick out... Uh, today which is uh, April the what is it April the 8th yeah and he's character is what we are competence is what we can do the reality is that character and competence drive everything else in the organization so every single day he's got a thought and it's uh, it's an interesting way of doing it but anyway there you go <laughs> so um, you're a cricketer or were a mm -hmm. cricketer right and uh, you know, you were uh, English international so kind of tell me how you got into that because it wasn't obviously a, a, a normal track through for uh, people. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I um, you know had a wonderful career. Uh, fortunate enough to go on and played Surrey County my whole career and then played England and at the height got to World Cups, won two World Cups in the Nashes series. So, you know, had saw the height with the team, but kind of the start for me was quite um, unusual. Most people, I suppose, were playing, you know, get involved through a cricket club or a bit of a network. I kind of grew up in a city, London, where there were no facilities, family didn't play, school didn't play. But what happened for me, luckily, is a talent scout came in, um, came into my primary school, gave me the opportunity to try it. I said, no, it looked rubbish uh, because I loved football. So I was actually at the age of 10 going, no, I was already kind of skeptical, thought it was uh, just not the sort of sport I wanted to play. Luckily, I had a good teacher who was like, it's an opportunity to grow, it's an opportunity to try something new. And that first time I hit the ball, I was hooked. And from that moment, I got talent scouted. So I kind of, once I got into the structure, it became, you know, the usual under sort of, I was in under 12, sorry, under 14s England, and then kind of your career spirals. But if it wasn't for that one day and that one time I hit the ball, I would have completely missed the sport. Serendipity, isn't it? Serendipity. But, you Definitely. know, what, is it, what does it feel like kind of coming through uh, a cricketer as a, as a female and obviously as, uh, mm. you know, the which wasn't very strong in the English team at that time. Um, you know, yeah. Did you, is there any difficulties or did you encounter any problems? Yeah, lots. I think there was a few. Um, I think all sorts of different things kind of stood out for me. One being female. Um, so the era I came through, you know, there was a strong international team, but women weren't uh, really respected as well when I sort of started playing. So 
Um, you know, you had to deal with comments regularly around sort of gender and what, you know, women should be doing and not doing. Um, didn't always have support, you know. I've been told a number of times, whether it's on social media, get back in the kitchen. You know, some of those views were quite strong back in the day. Um, yeah, so I'll say from a... A uh, gender perspective, I found it quite hard and it took a long time. Um, I was often playing in male dominated environments in my early career as well. So you had to be quite resilient to manage all that sort of stress. I think in a city and also, you know, I grew up in a sort of pretty working class family and background where, um, you know, we didn't have a huge amount of money. So just get just getting to training was quite hard for, you know, financially. So again, my mum sort of um, fortunate, she worked nights to allow me to play international oh, cricket because crazy. yeah that's a big sacrifice she because what she would do is she would work through the night and then finish early in the morning and take me if I had to go to Nottingham or different places for training stay up all day go back and go straight to work yeah. so yeah I learned a lot about resilience I think from um from my mum and then finally I'll say also ethnicity so I'm the first black woman to play cricket for England uh which is, it seems, still seems to me odd because you would have thought there'd have been more diversity. Um, but it was, it was very different culturally for me to kind of move from a very multicultural London environment to a less so in the team. So yeah, I had a lot of struggles, but I think the one thing that I'll say that stands out is like resilience. I'll say that's one thing that I've been uh, tested so much through life. I feel like I've got a strong base of resilience with life. Okay. And, and you, you won an actress. That must be an unusual feeling for a, an English cricketer because I've only ever been involved twice and uh, that's with the Australians. Uh, so I've had two successes and I'm retiring now based on spending the rest of my life talking about those two successes. So, you know, what was, what was that feeling like? You know, where, where, yeah. where, do you think, where do you think English cricket is at right now? Yeah, good question. Well, first of all, England and being the Aussies, that's the only goal. Like, that's the thing you'll set as soon as you pick up a bat and you want to play, your one mission in life is to beat the Aussies. Um, and, you know, also they dominated for most of my career. They still kind of do now in the women's game as well. So to have been part of that win is like, I don't know, it's like it means so much because you just you just got one chance to stick it to them. But, you know, they stuck it back to us many times. So, yeah, no, being part of that is incredible. Being part of a team and winning that is amazing. Where cricket is now, well, at the whole, I mean, we've got the men and women's game. We've got COVID-19. Um, I just came back from Australia, actually. We had the women's World T20 packed out stadium 86,000 for the final um Katy Perry did the final so I think women's cricket that just shows it's on a high I think the men's game as well um you know seeing what Ben Stokes has achieved over the last sort of 12 months just shows a side that are I don't know they've clicked from the 50 over world cup and they're starting to get test cricket so I think from an English perspective we've got a lot of players that are firing on the global stage at the moment you know I think you know there's a lot of nervousness around COVID-19 and how that's going to impact the cricket world but I can't wait for it to get going again that's for sure. Mm. And you, you you mentioned COVID-19 and obviously it's the big topic of uh, of the uh, the world right now. How, how are you coping with this? You know you're obviously at home so how are you kind of filling your day and, and filling your time? Yeah I'd have to say it was an, it's a massive adjustment for me. I, I've spent either most of my years traveling non-stop playing or commentating now as a broadcaster um, or I'm out every night so I'm not one of those sort of who knows how to sit very still um, so like as soon as you're locked down I think the first week was just like the mind was frying I have to say um, luckily and I don't know if you can see it in the background but I've got like a I've, I've got a passion in drums so I've got a little drum kit down there I've got guitars okay. Um, so I've been, yeah, getting back into or spending a lot more time on my music. Um, I play drums. I've got a bit of guitar, playing, making some songs. I've got a lot of fitness gear, so I've been um, working out, although I've overdone it and my back's a bit sore at the moment. Um, I'm reading. So, you know, some, we always say we don't have enough time to sort of get into those books. So um, I've just been catching up. But I have to say the one thing that has made this whole period easy for um, me anyway is technology. Just being able to connect with you like this and keeping interaction with different people throughout the day i love people so uh, that's made such a difference now and, and, and yeah i i would agree with that you know i I've, I've never really used technology in the way that i've started using it recently um you know so it's always been kind of one-to-one -one coaching you know face to face um and over the last couple of weeks you know i've had much more interaction with uh, other people and i have an 11 year old boy um so i've started doing a podcast with him on a friday and about mindset where he asks me questions 
and the, you know, I've only done a number of kind of Facebook live, I think four, four so far, so I've just started the journey, but he's killing me on views. Yeah, he's, <laughs> much more popular, right? and he's, he's kind of given it to me and I'm thinking like, I've got to shut this kid down, right? But it's, uh, it is uh, uh, a, a, an experience uh, and, and, and Zoom is, uh, is obviously, uh, uh, is, is helping us have, have this conversation right now. Um, and what advice would you give to other people, obviously, um, you know, who are in a similar circumstance as the both you and I are in, um, that uh, may be struggling or maybe kind of thinking what they should do or how they fill their time? Yeah, I definitely think the one thing that worked for me, which I was struggling with, is routine. So I think as soon as this happened, you kind of go into a day flow of, you know, you might not shower till 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, maybe not even till the, the end of the day. I think what I started doing is actually like planning out my days on, on the weekend. So I did a sort of sit down. What do I want to get out of this week? And I put in slots um, as if I was going to work, get up, get showered, work out at set times, do my work admin or broadcasting, some of the stuff I'm doing from home. And I found that if you if your day is structured till sort of four or five o'clock in the afternoon, then it feels like a normal evening um, mm. where you might catch up with friends on the phone. So that completely took away the anxiety and the stress that I was having. Um, and then once I got into a routine and sort of adjusted, then now I don't have to be as rigid with it. So I'd definitely recommend if you're like me and a bit tetchy, uh, make sure you get that in and also take advantage of that walk as well. Um, I, I structure mine in the middle of the day just to break it up and it, it does make a difference, you know, socially distanced, but, just getting some fresh air, keeping as many windows open has made such a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a very difficult time. And, and, and I know that a lot of people are, are struggling with it. And, and I agree. And I often talk about, you know, um, smiling at the day, but the structure of the day is really important and, and, and making sure that you have that structure and you, you have that routine um, and that you kind of work your way through it because, you know, you just don't want a waste of time. You know, it's, 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 you know, everybody is entitled to a meltdown. You know, the only mm. point I'd say, you know, don't get comfortable there. You know, get yourself up and, and, and kind of take, take action and, and respond to it. Um, and, and what about cricket itself? Obviously, it's stopped right now. Mm. So have you any views or thoughts about, you know, what's going to happen this season? Um, you know, I've just come off the back of a conversation with Cameron Bancroft, who's kindly did a podcast with me uh, uh, yesterday. Um, you know, he was supposed to be coming back to Durham, and and, and we we talked obviously about the uh, the men's game. So, you know, where do you where do you see the season going to? Yeah, so I'm I'm always optimistic. I'm maybe overly positive. Um, so what has happened? ECB, there's talk that the season could extend for the first time in I think it might be ever, but into October if possible. So I'm mm. feeling like we may get some cricket sort of late August, maybe September for five or six weeks, which would most probably closed behind closed doors. I don't imagine we're going to get mass gatherings until there's a, a vaccine that's rolling out. So I, I kind of see some behind closed doors cricket. Uh, there's talk that the four day game, so the, the championship won't be played. And the hundred, which was a big tournament that was meant to launch this year with all the international stars, that's going to get parked too. So, you know, the blast, I think, which is the T20 tournament that I think will take place if it does that, it will provide people who are fans, you know, who already are fans of the counties and the local players and all the England players. It will provide them with something to, to look forward to. So I really hope that happens. The other challenge is really, like everybody's experienced, the business challenges of, you know, financially, a lot of teams are trying to make sure they can keep their cash flow afloat. A lot of staff have been furloughed in a number of the counties. Um, so the other thing is not just can cricket come back it's when that is given the, the go-ahead they need to get staff back on board up to speed and moving so operationally I think there'll be a lot to work with but I'm still confident I'm still I'm always optimistic maybe I'm overly optimistic um, but I think we could see maybe four or five weeks of cricket and if so that would be the dream. Oh yeah and, and, and I'd support that because as you are well aware my dream is that the football season is extended <laughs> and Liverpool get the opportunity to go on and uh, win as a, as a fanatical uh, Liverpool fan. But you know one of, one of the interesting things for me Ebony is uh, you know you, you, you obviously know that I've, I've worked with the uh, you know some uh, male international cricketers um, but I was asked by a, a female cricketer um, to coach and what I couldn't believe was the difference in the salary range, right? Of what mm. she was is against what they were. And I was kind of, you know, it, it, it was so far apart that it was just unreal. You know, and she was 
kind of explain to me, I can't afford to pay you because, you know, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and, you know, it just felt so wrong to me. And is, is it something that you agree with? Is it, you know, it, it's obviously a problem. Uh, mm. uh, what would your commentary on it be? Yeah, I do a lot of work champion, championing sort of, um, you know, quality in women's sport. I think where we are, so I take my era, I was amateur, then moved into sort of semi-professional where I don't mind this sort of saying, but at my top, I got £15,000, which in London, that's not getting you very far, but it was, you know, enough to keep you kind of ticking with other sources of income. So I've kind of seen that era where there was very little uh, funding and we mostly saw the best. And then now we've got to a stage in England anyway, where the players are well remunerated in England and Australia. They've really led the charge. The challenge, though, is that I think there's a bit of a a cycle to be broken a bit like we've seen in women's football it's do they wait for the income to come through from packed crowds and broadcast income before they start paying the players or do they start paying the players well to get the standards up to drive that and it's interesting what different countries are approaching i think most are taking the we'll wait till the audience comes we'll wait and and then reward the women um, but then that sees the game sort of stay behind. Whereas in Australia, for example, Australian women are very well looked after. I think they get paid more than the New Zealand men and many other um, nations. So they're very well looked after. And what we're seeing at the international level anyway, and they've also invested more. So their broadcast numbers are going up. Their standards is going up. They just had 86,000 coming in. So I think it takes people with real leadership skills to decide to break that cycle to see that quality happen quicker and you know I think we're seeing movement I I realize that there are sort of commercial and financial challenges around um, you know making all women's sport equal in pay uh, but that gap has got to close and I think in the next 10 years we need to see some real advancement in that gap being narrowed significantly. Mm, and it's, 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 it's an interesting point and uh, you know it's a, it's a topic of absolute fascination for me because my wife runs kind of leadership uh, women in leadership programs um, and uh, which we call kind of we step forward, uh, and I'm always fascinated because uh, I, I was involved in the kind of political campaign in the, the UK recently, talking about the Labour leadership, right? So I kind of um, helped some uh, some people out, and and and, and Labour has never had in its 180 years history had had a female leader, um, mm. and I was getting a lot of commentary from people saying, you know, we should pick on talent, and of course we should pick on talent. But for 180 years, we haven't been picking up on it. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, and even if we continue at the same rate of pickup in, you know, the House of Commons right now, it'll be 2050 before there's equality in numbers. And, and you know, so I, I think that there needs to be, you know, another revolution. And, and people talk to me about the glass ceiling. We need to break the glass ceiling. And I'm thinking, you're already putting the ceiling on us, right? You know, we need to kind of just totally and utterly smash the hell out of it and get it out of the way. So, you know, so for me, I'm kind of very passionate on the topic that it's, it's, it is about leadership. It is about, you know, creating the opportunity, but it's got to be much more than that. It's got to be much more than that. If we're going to kind of, you know, correct the trend of the past, because it's just too slow. Um, yeah, I, I think just, you're right. You're completely right. I think what, what you said makes so much sense because I'm just thinking like you, you have to be in a position where you have to think forward sort of 10 to 20 years and say, what picture do we want? And there's no doubt you want that to be much more diverse, equality in place, uh, gender parity, those sort of things. And like you say, if, if there are no leaders or very few coming through from, you know, different backgrounds or different uh, genders, it's not going to change. So I, I do feel that we need modern day leaders. Uh, biases as well do sometimes, well, not do sometimes, they definitely do exist in, in the world, in all of us. Uh, there's a good book I read not too long ago, which reminded me of the biases I hold. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's important that leaders, I think you need fresh leadership, fresh mindsets to kind of set the vision and then work towards it. And, and, you know, and, and, and it's an interesting topic because it's one of the things that I talk quite a lot about, you know, what I call kind of bias interrupters. How do you interrupt the biases that are part of our subconscious thinking? That's a, a topic for another day. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just feel, you know, that in cricket or in football, you know, there is, you know, the top 5% and they're being rewarded well and there's probably equality. And, and, but, you know, where we're looking at the grassroots, when we need the feeder pool coming through, where we need to drive the change, 
then I just don't see it happening in the way that I think it should be happening. Uh, and I don't think that some of the, you know, the, the, the football authorities or the cricket authorities or the rugby authorities for, for mm. are, are, are any of them are necessarily making the changes uh, that are, are going to achieve that particular goal. One thing I was just going to ask you, uh, your opinion, I don't know if you've seen, um, cricketers have taken a pay drop for a certain period of time and they're donating a certain amount. I think football, I don't know what's quite happening in football, but I know it's, and it, in some ways, moments like this, when sort of COVID-19 comes into play, starts to force us, whether it's through business or sport, to really work out what's really important and where the money needs to be distributed and how. Um, and I just, there's something about the fact that the players are, I know in cricket, they definitely have done that and the money's going to go to grassroots cricket, starts to kind of plant that seed of, you know, if you want to lead in the future, you want to make changes um, and have impact. I just wonder if in some ways at the other side of COVID-19, it might force us to start thinking about what's really important. Where do we invest? How do we invest that money and bring that parity? And, you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of work on, uh, you know, what is the mindset for the future and, you know, for the kind of tsunami that's coming. Uh, because, you know, there will be, and it's a word that people use a lot, but a new norm. Um, and it will take a, a different type of mindset. And what are the characteristics and behaviours that you need to display within that? Because both in a physical and a social and in a behaviour and an emotional point of view, you know, the world will change. You know, we will see much more of this. We will be much more technology enabled. But there's still a billion people around the world who are affected in their jobs at this moment in time. And that's kind of a, a tragedy. And, and we've certainly got an appreciation of the Amazon driver who, who continues to kind of keep us connected to the outside world. Or I was talking to the postman this morning, right, you know, on the basis that, you know, there are people that are still out there and, and they are essential. So certainly we now realize what is essential to us, you know, mm -hmm. to keep living and not, not, so much, and not so much just to give us the life, you know, I miss my cup of coffee and go to the coffee shop. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do passionately believe um, you know, that we were on a trend of change. You know, it was a, an evolution. Uh, I think that, you know, COVID-19 has just thrown, you know, a huge blast into our thinking and into our world. I think the consequences for us will be absolutely significant. You know, and for me, in, in, in the work that I do, you know, what is it the thinking that we need? What is it the controls that we need? What is it the type of leaders that we need? You know, where can we help? Where can we coach people through? Um, and that's kind of basically, you know, how I'm filling my time right now in, uh, in getting that. And I've just, you know, I'm launching a program now for uh, uh, doctoral students. Um, I'm doing this next week, doctoral students in Belfast and in Durham and in Newcastle and a number of universities online program talking about that particular issue and also what would be the types of things that they need to be thinking about adopting and looking at in order to be enabled to address some of the challenges that are coming our way. I completely agree with all that. In my mind, I'm, I'm thinking about, we, I feel like we need a, a new type of leadership or a, a fresh type of leadership. And um, I feel like we all, as people are looking for it, but also we need to start the conversations locally about what we feel we need and start to drive change. I think there's an opportunity for new voices to be heard at this moment because, you know, people need more empowerment. So look, it's going to be a new, um, it's going to be a new world. I think, you know, I feel for a lot of the people at the moment who are potentially losing, you know, I haven't lost my job yet, but you know, these things could happen to who knows, but there's going to be a lot of people losing jobs, but there's also new avenues of jobs I've seen created as well so it's about inspiring people to look for new opportunities stay open but the world is going to change so much um, and I just hope we're ready for it yep and, and well we well we have to get ready so you know so you do test match special and so that's that's, that's that's where I saw you um I saw also that you do some podcasts are you still doing the podcasts yeah, so I, I did a load, did a whole series. I've got about twenty five out. Um, it's called The Art of Success, and mm -hmm. as you know, when I first um, spoke to you on BBC, I got so obsessed with mindset. I love um, learning about people. So what I've done is I've interviewed uh, people across business, sport, politics. So I've had people like Alistair Campbell, um, who's a former spin oh, doctor. Did, such, uh, I did a lot of work. That would have been enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. Ar argumentative to the last. 
<laughs> he is. He's a he's a fascinating mind. He is. He's um, great fun. He's written a really good book actually called Winners. Um, so he's good fun. I had him on. I've had like Olympic athletes. I had a lady called Alison Felix, who's one of the most medaled oh, more than Bolt. She's an American sprinter. Has more medals than anyone. So I I interviewed her just as she broke his record. Um, mm. So I've had I've had all sorts of people. I've had actors. Um, it's just been what's what's really interesting to see is one it broke my myths about what i thought i think i always saw these people as superhuman um mm. and just capable of you know just more things than everybody else and actually what you learn is their ability to be resilient um i think i saw a little bit of grit and steel actually people quite enjoyed proving people wrong there was that sort of underneath bubble of that mm. um and also they all sort of had a vision um but i think they were quite strategic that's one thing i keep saying to people is um I don't think it was just hard work and grind away. I think a lot of these people thought quite carefully about, you know, how are they going to get there? What people do I need to be around? All the sort of leverage tools. So it's a good fun podcast. I've, I'm mostly going to get you on it, actually. I'm going to mostly do another series. So I'm going to get you on because we talk loads about the mind. I love that stuff. So you're coming on, um, but it's a really good podcast. It's worth listening to. And it is. But, you know, I think that and the thing that I find in, in, in my work, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, people like you, um, you know, who are stars in their own right and, and, and who are role models for lots of other people is, you know, there's kind of two things that, you know, that I found that, that I learned particularly uh, uh, from engaging. One was just finishing the process, finish the process, finish the process, finish the process, finish. So what, you know, and it's, you know, you, you, you know me through Steve Smith, you know, I, I'm going to do 10,000 balls, I'm going to do 10,000 balls and I'm only going to move my wrist that much for 10,000 balls, but that's what I'm doing and I'm going to finish it. But the, the, the other point in it, and the learning for me, which was uh, also that, you know, failure is not the opposite to success. You know, the failure is part of success and, and their willingness to fail. Um, and that's again, you know, a, a learning for all of us because, you know, we think that we have to be perfect or we have to achieve, um, but we also have to fail regularly in order to understand, you know, when you take a picture, and it's a bad picture, well, then you know the next time, you know, the picture that can be good or what to look out for. So looking at that, taking millions of bad pictures allows you to kind of make that one brilliant picture. Um, but we have to get that mindset in our head. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and I'm conscious of your mm. time. Uh, and I had a, a few questions, kind of quick fire questions for you, right? Um, you know, that just, you know, you, you've talked about your band, so I'm looking forward to uh, your, your new career as a drummer. Uh, <laughs> Right. Um, so I look forward to hearing the music on that. But, you know, what kind of music do you particularly like? Yeah, so I love uh, R&B, um, sort of modern R&B, old school R&B. But my favourite music is definitely like the old school 60s, 70s, Aretha Franklin, Marvin Gaye. The old oh, school God, you're song. Right back, you're right back in my time frame. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> and, uh, look older you know, what do you do like so uh, you know I'm, I'm always conscious you know i can't ask you whether you like tea coffee or alcohol but do you like tea coffee or alcohol if i was to ask that question how would you answer it i would i like a lot of alcohol i definitely like my glass of wine i'm a sauvignon blanc, sauvignon blanc person and prosecco and then i love tea i've got like a tea maker it's amazing this quite a ridiculously expensive machine that brews my tea to perfection on a timer every day with the, the, the loose leaves. So I'm obsessed with tea and I'm not too bad with alcohol as well. <laughs> and who's your sporting hero? Oh, do you know what? My sporting hero is my boss, um, Alex Stewart, who's a former England cricketer, one of the former England captains, has... I think he was one of the most capped players of all times. Um, I grew up at Surrey, like looking at him as a he hero. I like, had the posters on the wall. And now, because um, he's director of men's cricket, I'm director of women's cricket at uh, Surrey. It's weird to like be working alongside your, your hero. Um, so it's him and he, he still inspires me. It's his birthday today, actually. And I just messaged him. So yeah, I'm fortunate enough to have got close to my actual hero, which is quite rare. <laughs> I know that's that's a, that's always an interesting point because when I when I was talking to my son and we were talking about leadership, you know, he threw me one of the questions. He says, "Are you a good leader?" Right? Um, and I was saying, "Oh, come on, you're not supposed to be here asking me those type of difficult questions." Um, so when you get close to sporting leaders, you, you you do see the human side of them, you know. So is there any any 
kind of human side of Alan Stewart that you would share with us? <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't say he's, he is, he is exactly what he was as a player, which actually is quite nice to see. He is so disciplined. It's ridiculous. So it's his birthday D-Day and you'd think most people would chill out and he's gone for a 6.30am 6, 6 run. But what he, he does is he keeps life simple. I'd say that's what he does. You know, if you want to get something done, just get it done. Just do it. Don't delay. Um, so he always has made me uh, up my standards. In terms of a human element, yeah, I don't know. He's just so, I don't know. He's so straight down the line. It's, he is what it is, does what it says on the tin kind of person. So, um, yeah, it's nice to meet someone who's actually so refreshing and very straight talking. It's, um, you know exactly where you stand. You know exactly what the, the, the world is going to be around him. Adam, it, it was a pleasure on Test Match Special when I met you the first time. It's been an absolute pleasure today. Thank you for your time. Um, you, you are one of my role models now. I keep an eye on you regularly as to what you're up to. Um, you know, good luck through uh, COVID-19 and the isolation. Uh, you know, hammer that out of those drums, right? You know, <laughs> now in my head that you're just absolutely giving it. Um, so uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, I look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it.